Om Shravanu Yapi Buhu Bir Yo Na Labyaha Shin Vato Pi Bahavo Yam Naviduhu Ascharyo Vakta Kushalo Shalabdaha Ascharyo Gyato Kushalo Nushishtaha Om Shantihi 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 Many there are who have never heard of the Atman, the great self within. Many others, though they hear of it, fail to comprehend it. Fortunate is the one who hears of it. Wonderful is the one who speaks of it. But extremely blessed is that one who, having heard of it from the lips of an illumined preceptor, is able to realize it here and now in this very lifetime. Om peace, peace, peace. Om Dhanur Grihit Vau Upanishadam Mahastram Sharam Hupasanashita Sandhyayita Ayamya Bad Tad Bhavakatena Jitasa Laksham Tadevaksharam Somya Vidti Om Shantihi 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 Taking as bow that mighty weapon furnished by the Upanishads and other non-dual scriptures. Fasten to it the arrow of mind, sharpened by thoughts on reality alone. Then drawing full strength, O student, release and penetrate that mark, the Atman, the imperishable Brahman. Om peace, peace, peace. Om Satyena, Om Satyena, Labhyastapasa Yesatma, Samyagyanena, Brahmacharyena, Nicham, Antaha Sharilehi, Jyotir Mayohi Shubraha, Yam Pashanti, Atayaha Kshina Doshaha, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. The Atman, the indivisible self in all beings and all things, is realized by knowledge, by moderation, by austerity, and by veracity. All of these constantly cultivated. When mental impurities dissolve due to this practice, then the seer beholds it everywhere, existing in everything, even here in this very body. Om peace, peace, peace. Om Sahana, Om Sahana, Vavatu, Sahana, Ubunaktu, Sahaviryam, Karva, Vahai, Tejasvi, Navadi, Tamastu, Mavidvi, Shuvahai, Om Shanti 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 May Brahman, the reality, protect us. May Brahman sustain us. May Brahman illumine our thinking process. May we not find fault with each other, with the teachings or with the world. And may what we study be a source of inspiration to us eternally. Om Peace, Peace, Peace. May peace be unto us and may peace be unto all. Om Hari Om. We are all present today on Saturday, both the live audience here at the Ashram in Portland, Oregon, and also the live streaming audience and Swagatam. We welcome you all in to the Dharma because certain amount of hours each week in our life we are enjoined to plunge our minds into the teachings of the various darshanas of india all the great seers say so right on up to sri ramakrishna who is our ideal here at the srv association who said that you must dip your mind into the lake like a towel uh, or your cloth 
over and over and over again until it's absolutely saturated and completely malleable. That is, then it's at your control. Usually the mind is not at our control and it's following the senses out or it's following the ego in its various course and getting into trouble like a child. But um, when it's under control, it becomes saturated with the dharmic teachings, then, of course, you must say, you could squeeze out that excess water and, and let it dry in the sun of knowledge. So you're sure to take in this copious amounts of wisdom teachings from the scriptures, and best if they're the revealed scriptures, shruti, that is, those scriptures that talk to you about your relationship with the divine, as we were just chanting them. Uh, sharpen the mind with teachings on God alone, thoughts on God alone, and then point it at the Atman, release and penetrate the mark, and realize yourself as the eternal Brahman, or as we say sometimes in Christendom, I and my Father are one, followed by, be thee perfect as thy Father in heaven is perfect. So we know as of last night in our book signing event we had for the new book, Manasana, how to take spiritual postures, mental postures to to uh, remove inconsistencies and attain a higher state of mind. In that very way, we have to maintain this posture of jnana yoga or atma gyan. And those teachings will be revealed to us in various ways. The way the Taittiriya Upanishad has been revealing to us has been accenting food. So if, if you know those chants or those blessings that you say over food in Vedanta, like Brahmar Panam Brahmahavir, which we studied last Saturday, we took apart all the words of that sloka from the Gita, fourth chapter, then you know that food is an important thing. And many people, when they come to spiritual life, are questioning about it. At first, of course, they'll get the teachings of eating pure food and turning it into prasad, making sure that it's blessed. Then they'll find out next how to bless it themselves with certain mantras that they can use, and the mantras of which they'll need to know the meaning of. That is, just like you need to know the ingredients of your food, you're going to have to know the ingredients of your mantra and what it means and what it entails. So food starts stepping up, what well, it is rather in this ladder of ascension, inward ascension, we call it. And then pretty soon you're going to hook it up with your excellent health, which the yogi or yogini always has, good posture, good breath, good complexion, uh, the whole, and finally a, a mind that's obedient and willing to train. Adhikarasana, you know, adhikara means to, I'm, I'm ready to qualify myself. So uh, the mind is always open to that kind of uh, higher suggestion and starts to close itself off to the insinuations of the world and worldliness, uh, giving it the least attention or only uh, the basic attention. Same with the body, just giving it enough attention so that it remains healthy and it can follow the path inward because the body will be abandoned on so many occasions, like deep sleep, uh, s sleep itself, death, a good meditation, the body just gets left behind as is of almost um, no significance whatsoever. So the seers say, give it just what it's, what is its due, and uh, uh, maybe uh, stay away from um, too much excess in that regard. Atman's realized by moderation, we just chanted. Like I was driving through Portland last night and I saw a huge crowd outside of a shop. And I looked at the shop and it's all about hairdressing and haircutting and hairstyles. So all these people were standing around thinking about their hair all day and then trying to look good for others and so forth. And that kind of vanity, when Vivekananda came here, he said, the Americans are good people, but boy, they pay so much attention to the body. So many tools for cutting the nails and for trimming the eyebrows and for painting the face. And, and so he was uh, really amazed at how much attention we paid to the body and double amazed at how little attention we paid to the spirit. <laughs> so whatever you might say about the body, you should include this teachings of spirituality into your diet. And we're talking about food, right? So diet on all levels. And 
as we're finishing up the Taittiriya Upanishad today and tomorrow, we'll come to the final lesson of the third chapter and conclude that work. We've been working on it maybe a year and a half or, or more in my visits here to Portland and to San Francisco. And, and so uh, we'll move on to another Upanishad. We've studied so many of them already, and that is Vedanta. Vedanta equals Upanishad. It really means what's taught in the Upanishads. So this idea of food as it steps in the ladder of ascension has been on the minds of uh, seers. And it's a higher teaching than just g eat good food and be healthy. That's called mukya prana. But it's eat good food, be healthy, and then use the food from, use the energy from food to, to move deeper inside to the next level, to uh, store up some energy for spiritual life. That's called ojas. Spiritual orange juice, if you want to say, well, spiritual OJ. So you want to move inward in that regard and store up some energy so that not only will the problems of life be much easier to deal with then, because they will be coming at everyone, saint and sinner alike, because they're in a form, so the attendant problems will, will be there. Um, but also f so that you can have this inner life, and I was talking about that last night at our book signing event, that uh, it's very questionable whether many of us in the West even have an inner life yet. We're, we're doing a lot of posturing and posing outside and, and a lot of lip service to the scriptures, but to see the actual realization of it is very rare in, in any given being. Uh, and Swami Vivekananda used to remark on that too. He said, there are temples by the hundreds and books by the thousands, but oh, for just an ounce of practice. Oh, just an ounce of practice. He'd like to see that in someone. Someone actually sat down and practiced rather than just listen or go on pilgrimage or do a little bit of offering at the altar or something, but actually sit down and practice. And so that's going to entail that you get this energy from food. Man does not live by bread alone. As we know, that Christ told the fishermen along the river, so and they need to get an inner life established. And the way we've been teaching that lately, and Vivekananda remarked on this as well, is connecting the prana to the mind. We know there's energy in our senses, but nobody sits down and says, what is it by which my eye sees? What is it by which my ear hears? What is it by which my tongue tastes and so forth? Uh, the actual visitation of the prana into the body and, and its connection to the breath. What is it that causes my lungs to breathe? You see, people are thinking maybe the breathing exercise itself is prana or the lungs are prana. But no, it's a subtle energy that's causing the flow there or the all-pervasiveness there. As we know there are five kinds of prana. One's all-pervasive and one moves up and one moves down and one carries the nutrients to the blood and so forth. Well, let's take that prana that carries the nutrients to the organs, you see, and just that one alone. And let's say, well, that's on the physical level. But then there must be a prana that's subtle, that's a correlate of that, that carries the wisdom to your brain or to your mind, that distributes the nutrients there, you see. But, but if you're not open to it, then you don't understand the scriptures. You don't understand the words that are coming out of my mouth, you see. Uh, maybe you only understand them intellectually, but you haven't taken them and pondered them. That's practice. That's the ounce of practice you're looking for, is to actually sit down, stop everything else, and focus on the scriptures and the slokas and the, what the seers are telling you, and try and form your own conclusions around them, and then check them with your guru to see if they're correct. Check them with the words of the seers and the scriptures. So all of this is sort of a a quick expose or conclusion about, you might say, the whole three chapters of the Taittiri Upanishad, because here we are at the very end, and they're saying things like, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. I am food, I am food, I am food. I am the food eater, I am the food eater. I am the food eater. I am the combiner, I am the combiner, I am the combiner. I am the firstborn of the world order. I exist prior to the gods. I am the center and source of immortality. So why say it three times? Because there are three worlds and there are three bodies. You're bringing those affirmations to all three levels of your existence. If you want to understand that, the outer, the inner, and the transcendent. 
or the in-breath, the hell-breath, or the out-breath, or the A, U, and M of Om, or Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva of the Trinity, or your waking, dreaming, and deep sleep state. See? If you understand these connections, which is how the Upanishads started off talking about the Vyahritis and the combiner, the connections of things, which I'll show that chart again tomorrow because we started off with it, so I'll reshow it at the end of our classes, then you have an inner life, and then you have a good grounds for moving inward with all celerity and, and, and all stability, you see, no fears, no doubts. And you begin to prove to yourself these great teachings, that I am the source of immortality. I myself am Brahman. That's an asana called Ayamatma Brahma. It even sounds in Sanskrit almost like it is in English, I am Matma. You see. But it's ayam, A-Y-A-M, I am Atma, the Atma, Brahma. I am the connection or the the uh, the uh, identity of Atman with Brahman. That is my real, my true self, my true nature. So I got some very wonderful comments after last weekend's class on Lord Vashishta's teachings on the origin and perpetuation of disease. So I put up this chart. It's the one that came after that. Uh, from the same story, Shikidwaja, in Yoga Vishishta. And I thought, that not only is it a good summation for the point that we were taking here, and if you were following the text, then we're talking about this uh, lesson five and six, as we head towards lesson 10, which is the end. So we're taking, we took five or six of these slokas last Saturday and Sunday, read them out, gave a basic explanation of them, and now I'm taking charts to explain some of the points in them. I'll be talking today in the first half of this class about putting a exclamation point on this teaching of food at all levels, and then moving on with that subject into the cave of the intellect, as was mentioned in, chap in lesson six here of chapter three, because uh, the cave of the intellect is that bridge you know, after the five sheaths have been transcended or after you move from dreaming to deep sleep and, and uh, you're, you're taking your consciousness aw uh, fully aware of it into these, this deeper state, it passes through the cave of the intellect and in there is a kind of food too. It's uh, amrita or nectar that you sip there. Interesting, I find that there's a word in Sanskrit called amrita, nectar, and then anrita. The only difference in the word is one spelled with an M and the other spelled with an N. And anrita means negativity. Uh, so there's this positive nectar and then there's this negative poison. They're kind of opposite of each other. And uh, so you want to neutralize the one and realize the other. In that regard then, food is happening at all levels and the teaching on food is also happening at all levels. So, um, this means that we're going to wrap up this teaching on the origin and perpetuation of disease with this follow-up called the destruction of disease. Now, this is a, is a summation put in a different order of what uh, was on the chart before, but it also uh, ends up with a, with a sort of uh, guide. I have sort of a guide of how this happens. I've uh, reiterated that a little bit in the introduction to this class, but you can see there that when we studied before, we found out that there were two causes of disease, primary and secondary. But first, before that, we have to remember that Ram asked, what is the origin of disease? And uh, Vashista answers, the origin of all disease is the mind. So it's a powerful teaching to know that because then we won't, be late, we won't be either praising health or blaming health on any other cause except the mind, like say God or devil or going outside without a coat on or in, in the rain or something. We're going to have to trace all the, the origins of disease back to our mind, back to individual, collective, and cosmic mind. Diseases aren't just cancer and Alzheimer's and various things like that, but they're also war, violence, and uh, bitterness, and delusion, and so forth. So 
that's all a kind of poison in all the kind of food we're taking in, isn't it? If everything is food, if food is Brahman and all is food, then we we look in the other direction and we see that there's a poison in each one of those foods, a potential poison. So then if we're saying, I am the food, I am the food, I am the food, I am the enjoyer, I am the enjoyer, I am the enjoyer, I am the connector, I am the connector, I am the connector on all three levels, A-U-M, then we're going to have to be very particular about neutralizing the poisons in all levels of food. This is a more comprehensive view that the Rishi is giving us. So, we see there primary disease of the mind listed, mind with its inherent diseases here. And then I have the wrong chart up here. I had yesterday's chart up here. Let me correct, get the correct one. Now you see that it's been put in a side-by-side -side rendering. Categories of disease are sara, which is essential. That's his disease associated with rebirth. The first cause of all disease is being born in a body. The mind produces the body, and then the body is born with inherent diseases in it. Some of those never uh, arise, you see, and others are, are coming forward for various reasons, and you'll have to look at the other categories to understand that. Um, basically, for the yogi or the yogini, if you keep your mind in a positive state all the time, watering the flowers and not the weeds, then you're leaving less, much less chance for any of these innate diseases of the mind to get a hold in your mind and to rise up. That's true from everything from delusion to a common cold, that you're keeping those things at bay by your natural state of positivity. We used to say that uh, the founder of SRV, I was saying, last night to people at the talk, the founder of SRV was so positive all the time, Lex Ixon. And uh, even when he, in the end, when he had intestinal cancer, he was, I, I was with him uh, on occasion, and, and he was absolutely positive all the time. It was just like it didn't even exist. So body is going to go, go the way of, of disease, but body also goes the way of food. Fire eats the body, diseases, uh, Insects eat the body, animals eat the body, whatever the case is, it'll, it'll get digested by other things in the universe. And so if your attitude is, is that you are the body, then you're going the way of nature, you're going the way of rebirth, going the way of birth, old age, decay, and death. But if your attitude is that the body is food for others, then give it away. You see, some of the Tibetan Buddhists write, say, what do you do with my body? when I die, put it out on the vulture peak there, the vultures can eat it. So then I can be of use to to some living being my whole life, you see. So they cast the body off without any second thought like that. Because, you know, they're developed their subtle body and they have five senses and five elements there in the dream state. And then they developed a body called a causal body. They can go into deep sleep, which is the only correlative we can really use for for uh, that kind of uh, causal body consciously and see the seeds for everything there. So you could say, you know, the first body is matter, right? And the second body is thought. And the third body is seeds, seed thoughts. And those are the three elements, as you were, that, that go side by side with the three bodies or the three states of awareness. So breathe. Breathe and uh, make that energy flow. You see, it's under your control. Um, now, <coughs> disease associated with rebirth, the second category of disease is samanya, ordinary, or diseases incidental to the body. Now, if you want to know the cause of disease associated with rebirth, it's lack of wisdom. I didn't have enough room there in that column to put discriminatory wisdom, or I would have. Wisdom means that wisdom of viveka, which separates the wheat from the chaff. That is, you know what's lasting and what's uh, temporary, what's uh, actual and what's ephemeral. So lack of wisdom is the first cause. And you would have to <coughs> cite Vivekananda saying, when they ask him, should a man be reborn? He said, I hope not, not until he can do so in full consciousness. 
So you have to believe that there are beings who, when they take a body, they plan everything out. You see, they look very carefully and through the three states of awareness, from the causal to the subtle to the gross, and they'll be able to work down, the con work their consciousness down and out to the physical, even to the very last detail, like choosing your parents and choosing your work and uh, choosing what karmas you have to burn if there are any left in you, because many of those kinds of souls don't have any left. So all those details are are set in in and established, just like earth is established in water and water in fire and fire in air and air in ether. Just that sure, and the senses go with those five elements. Just with just that much assurance, they are established in Atman in Buddha nature, if you want to say that. And they can move in and out with the least amount of resistance. They too have to take on the limitations of this physical body and suffer them to some degree. There was one occasion that reminds me of where Sri Ramakrishna's nephew had passed and he experienced great grief and sorrow. But he was over it a day later, completely. So he said, gee, now I know what, what people of the earth suffer when they lose a loved one. See? Well, you might say, oh, that's good, he was you know, having that experience, but the real meaning, I think, is that he never knew what suffering was until he came to earth. And then he got a, a, a nephew that was you know, close to him and lost him, and then he felt what people suffer here. But it su doesn't suggest that, oh, he's imperfect because he suffered. It suggests that he's not used to suffering. He's used to bliss. See? That's his state of mind all the time, inner and outer, bliss, peace, contentment, so forth. So the fact that he was over this death just in a short amount of time shows that grief could not hold on to him, that bliss was his natural nature, and that took over and kicked in after a short period of bliss. Well, people will lose their loved ones and have elongated periods of bliss, of, of grief, you see. Uh, the more you can truncate that is based on how... Uh, how much you've realized bliss and peace as your true nature, your Atman, and how you can come out of that, you see, quickly. So the whole thing then is, as far as Lord Vashishta is concerned, is that discriminative wisdom, you don't, wouldn't want to come into the body or into this life without it. Don't leave home without it. See? Home is Atman and then the world is your sojourning place. And, I mean, isn't that what we sing quite often when we sing these songs? It's illustrated very nicely in songs. Mono chalo nija niketane Mono chalo nija niketane Shamshara videshe that was the first song that Swami Vivekananda, as Narendra, sang to Sri Ramakrishna when they first met. It's O oh mind, return to your own home, your true abode. You are a foreigner in this foreign land. Why, why do you roam about aimlessly with no real purpose? The five senses and the five elements, all these are different from you. None of them belong to you. Why have you become senseless in your attachment to others and forgotten your own true nature? So, there's the realm of rebirth. And you don't want to leave your home and, and do so without your discriminative wisdom that is so well evinced in that one verse. See, your eternal abode, your sojourning place, and then you know, how, to, how to detach yourself from the five elements and the five senses as you live in the body and remain aware of your true nature, Atman. And definitely skip that part about aiming about, uh, roaming about aimlessly. See, 
You want to have your divine purpose intact when you come here. So five elements, five senses, all different than you. See, in other words, your true self is sentient, but those things are insentient. Those things are just vehicles for your consciousness. And when the consciousness abandons them, they shut down. Whether it's when you go into deep sleep tonight, your senses shut off. And you go into death, your senses and body shut down, see, till you want to animate them again with a new body. So you have to know the dynamics of coming and going. But you also have to know, as Vivekananda said, that coming and going is all mere nonsense. Where's the time when the soul will come, when all of time is in the soul? And where's the space that it will move to, when all the space is in the soul? How nicely he puts it, you see. Time and space are all in you, nature is all in you, and in that way you can claim them. He says, all these are different from you, none of them belong to you. None of them belong to you in the fact that not, you can't really own something that's ephemeral, something that's empty, something that doesn't truly exist that, or doesn't have an eternal existence, you see. Anything that passes you want to let go of, and then you'll live a free and happy life, no matter what you call it. Whatever mode you work through, common work, higher mission, uh, then it's the same Atman in all beings, and, and uh, you can live perfectly free from those kinds of limitations and attachments. So beautiful truth and wisdom in these songs. Even in just one verse, like we say, mono chalo, my mind you know, so you must return to its true essence. And mind is what we're speaking about here with all its inherent diseases. The next cause of in line in the sara category is lack of sense control. And the third is presence of desires. Those are all causes for disease, as you can see. Let's go across the top. Mental delusion, mental disease, negative actions, karmic accrual, and physical disease actually spring from those causes, those secondary causes, which are a part of rebirth, you see. Um, and so you want to keep them at bay by Atmagyan. You always know the true nature of yourself, then your mind uh, easily skirts these kinds of problems, at the essential level even. And we'll look at that more in a, in a guide here below, but let's look at the Samanya category. It's ordinary cause of disease, or secondary if you will. There are diseases that are incidental to the body. <clears throat> the cause of them, however, is not what you would think. The primary cause of those is, is uh, negative thoughts. So this is a teaching how you want to keep your mind in a positive state of mind. Like I was saying, our founder, Lex Sixon, I always found him in an absolutely positive state of mind. Nothing could get him down. So uh, that kind of mental posture, as we were talking about last night, manasana, is highly valued by the seers. Krishna talks about it, oh, at least six or seven times in the early chapters of the Gita, calling it such things as stiti, pragnasha, and so forth. Uh, the man or woman of steady wisdom. You see, that steady wisdom is their protection, their shield, and their inspiration, all three. Uh, it protects you from the vicissitudes and vagaries of life and mind and disease, but it also inspires you. One is a all-pervasive prana, and the other is an up-moving prana, you see. So, you have the pranas of wisdom, uh, called psychic prana, at your beck and call. And they can uh, protect you from these insinuations and then they can also take you uh, beyond even uh, the thought of problems and solutions. Problems and solutions would be another duality that the mind can get caught in. You'll find a solution for this problem, but that solution causes another problem, and so forth and so on, you see. So you want to go to the ultimate source of those Vashishtha is telling you here. You know, just take the mind, dip it into the Dharma, dip it into thoughts of God alone. Sharpened like an arrow on thoughts of God alone, as I chanted this morning. And uh, keep it there. That's your mental posture, and there's no deviating from that. There's no compromise. It's not acceptable to fall from that standard you set for yourself. And the more you practice that, the more you can maintain it. It becomes strong. It's a good habit, rather than a negative habit, or a mixed good and bad habit, you see. You've 
you've run a, a pylon into the very bedrock of the river bottom, you see, uh, and nothing can sway it. It'll, like m maybe it will sway, sway the Bay Bridge in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. It's it's uh, irrepressible and steady all the time. That that steady wisdom we talk about. Now, if you look across the category from negative thoughts, we're talking about mental agitation that causes physical agitation, arrested prana that isn't flowing because if prana flows, and it's been used consciously, then it will keep these other uh, diseases at bay. It will naturally, good life force will naturally keep you from uh, succumbing to these kinds of physical diseases. And of course, the uneven pranic vibration. Now, you could say that's in the body and so forth, in the mind, but what about in your meditation? Your prana is there with you keeping your cent yourself centered on the mantra, then all of a sudden your mind wanders away from the med from the mantra, right? So you're thinking, oh, silly me, you see, I better put my mind back in concentration. But you're forgetting that it was the prana that that let you down, you see. The prana, the psychic prana let you down. So that's not even, is it? So you start breathing again. I mean, all the outer practices are just pointing to this, but nobody's seeing that point. They're seeing the outer causes. So don't go around blaming medicine for treating only the effect and not the cause. Look into your own causes and effects and blame yourself for not keeping up your prana, you see. No food or drink contains the noble self that knows itself, Vivekananda has told us. So cease lament, let go thy hold, you see. And uh, that's up to you. And you want to keep this, your eye then on the prana and make sure it doesn't either get arrested or flow off and on hot and cold. Uh, that's what I saw in my teacher, just constancy, 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 never a change in him. People would look at him and say, oh, that's a boring life. He's a monk's life. He doesn't have any fun and so forth and so <laughs> See, that's, you can just see what they're thinking and saying. You see. But then they're going out and engaging in all sorts of emotions and all sorts of ups and downs and all sorts of sufferings and all sorts of depressions, all sorts of pastimes that are unhealthy. And uh, like, uh, like um, intoxicants and so forth. So this is a, a person of steady mind, steady wisdom like that, is having bliss and peace inside. And that's what they value. Now, uneven pranic vibration will weaken the nerves and right on down to the body. Then food gets tainted and energy from food gets poisoned. So what he's saying here is that if your prana is flowing and even and your mind is concentrated, manaha prana sambandha is how we looked at that chart last week, if you remember, connecting the, the prana to the mind, to the illumined mind. If, if you have that in mind and it's successful, uh, then um, food will uh, taken in this state will be, will be beneficial and conduce to perfect health. Otherwise, it will weaken. The food gets tainted and energy from food gets poisoned. So we're talking about the best, purest, wonderful food, you see, full of vibrancy. But the person who takes it under this influence, it doesn't help them. They don't recover from their disease. Their mind is already given up, as it were. Their prana is already arrested. And unless you bring that back into connection, then the, then that very good food, you see. On the other hand, food that's just basic and not that pure, if a person with a pure mind takes it, he'll transport it, transform it into nectar. There's a saying in the scriptures of India that says, you know, man can live on vegetarian food all his life and fail to realize the Atman, but another man can eat pork, you know, and get realized toward the end of his life. So what's the difference there? Is it the food? Is it the eater? Is it the energy in the food? Is it the attitude of the mind? Now you're getting there, you see. The mind in the right state of mind will uh, be of perfect uh, uh, use and, and, uh, and benefit to the seeker. 
now across the board further to the cure and solution for these negative thoughts, mental agitation, physical agitation, arrested prana, weak nerves, and so forth, is thought purification, mantras, and medicines. Now, this is secondary. Um, you purify the thoughts means you water the flowers, not the weeds. You get rid of the negative thought. You know how uh, negative thoughts, you, you know how Patanjali speaks of that. There's the klista vrittis that are negative thoughts in your mind, and they have to be uh, neutralized by a klista vrittis, positive thoughts. So it's an ancient, uh, hundreds and thousands of years old teaching that some of us have seized upon in modern times in the West and so forth by putting out, you know, books on that kind of thing. But again, not with this kind of wisdom behind it, not knowing that rebirth is the cause of disease and that lack of discriminative wisdom is the next cause and so forth. If you look at it that way, you've got the secret to a good life right there. You've also got the possibility of not being reborn again, <laughs> which doesn't occur to most people. So all, both of those options are missing in most people's assessment of life and in their problems and solutions they're posing again. So thought purification, mantras, and medicines of secondary use. Well, let's put it this way. To transmute a disease via the mantra is what they're talking about. But the mantra goes deeper here. So there you see the step by step. Mantra is given to you by the teacher. So it gives you the mantra. You meditate on it. You understand its meaning. You're using it in meditation. And you're saying mantra over your food. That is, to be uttered in life and utilized in life and uttered over food is the next entry. Then serve the wise ones with that better energy. Do service. And that causes life to vibrate with divinity. So some of this is osmosis, as it were. Some of this is, is like, um, um, how you say, uh, a transference of energy that happens by, by, uh, by proximity. See, that is, you get with the wise and you have good energy and so forth. But all of a sudden, you're not getting the full point yet. You see, then what you want is uh, is to live with holy beings, holy company, as we were saying last night. And then there's something unspoken that happens there that allows you to get the point, you see, to reach that final goal. And it wasn't there before because you didn't have an example or you didn't have a working example in front of you and around you. That's sort of a subtle help that helps these these higher teachings get into your mind and, and actually y you can begin to master them. It's really hard to speak about, but Sri Ramakrishna said, uh, Master Weaver is there and Apprentice comes in. Can I apprentice you? He says, sure, sit down, we'll see. So he sits down there and watches the master weaver working with his different kind of balls of yarn around him, all different sizes. And so the apprentice, he soon, a couple hours pass, and he asks the apprentice, pass me that 32-strand yarn there. So the apprentice reaches out and grabs the 33-strand yarn and gives it to him. And the master takes it. No, not the 33, the 32 next to it. And so the apprentice is thinking, how did he know that? Just by a mere glance, one strand yard difference, you know, it's almost imperceptible. How does he know the difference between a 32 and a 33 strand yarn? I'll never pick this up. I'll never be a good weaver. See? But he stuck to it. He stuck around and pretty soon without the teacher even mentioning it, he began to intuitively know the difference between the yarns just by a mere glance. See? So this power came to him simply by apprenticing on the master. So that's one of the teachings about this hard to speak of subtlety that Sri Ramakrishna used to give. That a lot of these seemingly impossible steps in spiritual life become manageable, maybe even natural or easy, if you're in holy company. So this is what we mean, serve the wise ones, and that causes the life to vibrate with divinity. You, as it were, inherit this positive state of mind from those around you. And no more moping or depression or doubt or fear for you. 
no more rebirth in the matter, in, in the womb of matter for you, Ramprasad sings. Only emanation from my divine mother, from my divine source. So it's like uh, it's like tad vidhi prani patena pari prasyena sevaya upadek shanti te jnana jnani nas tattva darshanaha. Where is that from? Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita, yeah. So Krishna is telling Arjuna uh, about service of the wise and humility and then asking questions afterwards after you've done your service and you've been humble and you've prostrated and you know, then you, you can ask your questions about this, Atmagyan. Until then, uh, you know, you're, you're still as a, a bit distant from the source. Like, one of my one of the older disciples of Swami Sheshananda, my guru, once looked at uh, uh, Swami Sheshananda once looked at him and said, "Come closer." See, he was sitting right next to him. <laughs> Come closer. So he went. He kind of figured that out for a while, and then another day, Swami leaned over and said, "You have to get close to the fire mm -hmm. to get warm." So he kept dropping him these little hints, just out of nowhere, in the middle of talks. See? Uh, so. Finally, uh, he understood that he had to get really close to the guru and and uh, and uh, find what is there, mm -hmm. and then find the find the identity of of Jivatman with Paramatman. See, the teacher had done that, so if he did that with the teacher, then he'd inherit that divine treasure. See, so unspoken things, but very powerful. Now, the, the last entry at the bottom. Positive, meritorious actions override negative karmas. That's, of course, a great Buddhist teaching called punya and papa. They say it's sort of like the klista, a klista of yoga, but in Buddhism it's called non-meritorious actions and meritorious actions. This is, for instance, one way to transform work or service. Many of you are holding jobs, I know, where you're serving older people and, and for instance even Anahata who played last night at the book signing event uh, practices uh, thanatology and she goes to uh, old folks homes and plays harp for them uh, and lifts their mind out for at least for a time out of that worry and so forth. Others of you serve diseased and older people so that's a hard kind of work to do and so you want to make sure you protect yourself and at the same time have the ability to inspire and up uplift others, help maybe even relieve their suffering to a great extent or to a small extent. So these uh, meritorious actions will override karmas because when you get in the atmosphere of people like this, your memories of death, disease come, of your own death and disease that you've had in the past, you see. You may have been able to live a better life now and they haven't, uh, because of some of this process, they haven't come near you. But now when you get um, with, with the collective mind, these things start to suggest themselves to you as memories. The mind has got all inherent diseases, right? But it's also got all inherent cures. So if we're speaking specifically about disease, then we have to focus on that. But don't forget that all the cures are also in the mind. So poisons and ne ne nectars and poisons are both there. That's true of all the seven centers. The three lower ones, the heart, the throat, the third eye, and, well, this isn't even called a center anymore. Call it the seventh center, but it's beyond centers. So each one of these centers has a poison in it, and each one has a nectar in it. And you have to neutralize the one and realize the other. Maybe we can put that on a bumper sticker. Now, the whole thing, you see, leads to this, as far as Vashishta is concerned, food taken in this beneficial state of mind conduces to perfect health, otherwise turns to poison in the bloodstream. And again, you can be eating all the organic good foods you want, and that might be a good thing for you to do, especially if you're in the early stages of spiritual life and you want to be careful about what you eat and take in and how much you eat and take in. The quality of the food is going to be important, but it's not going to get to the cause of your problem. You'll be eating good food for weeks and all of a sudden you'll get sick. And that's coming from your past karmas. See, there's no other way to trace it. But I've been perfectly healthy. I've been running, I've been jogging, I've been biking, I've been hiking, I've been 
I've been eating good food. I've kept myself, and all of a sudden, at you. And you think, well, I biked without a coat on. No. See, uh, your psychic prana wasn't connected to your prana, and there was a gap, and it was uneven, and there was a break in it, and that's when that disease, that germ got in and made itself known to you and affected your body. So there are aberrations or inconsistencies in the flow of energy. You want them to be seamless. And it's going to be the same. We're not just talking about physical disease. It's going to be the same in meditation. If I can't meditate well and I'm beginning to fall from the goal, or I have periods of tamas, or there's depression in meditation, or there's um, restlessness in meditation, or I'm getting attached to the bliss of my meditation. All three of those are barriers to true meditation on Brahman, which is beyond bliss and beyond restlessness and beyond sleepiness, you see. Those are three of the four main uh, obstacles to meditation that Patanjali cites. The other one's being always going back and forth between dualities, good and bad, pleasure and pain. Your mind's always flip-flopping in the dualities. So those four obstacles to meditation can be removed in a seamless kind of consciousness. Wasn't I was nice saying that last night, that sometimes the masters of meditation will sit uh, for several hours, then they'll get up and go take tea or do some service or walk around or so forth. Then they come back to meditation it's as if all that time, that bardo, between the last, between the time he rose off of his cushion and the next time he sat back down, did not affect his mind at all. And he came back to the cushion in the same state of mind he left. See? So one seamless consciousness all the time, and it's going to be the same when you fall asleep tonight. You'll, most people fall asleep and they're feeling good, had a good day, so forth. They wake up unhappy. So they wake up depressed, they wake up heavy. What happened in my dreaming and deep sleep? You see, that's karmas came true to you. You see, they came forward and you brought some of them back to the waking state with you. If you know them and see them, you can neutralize them quickly, you see. But, but if not, they tend to hang over and cause a residue. That's called bad moods and so forth. So all of these problems of outer life have not just cures in inner life, but they have uh, eternal remedies, you see, or in transcendental life, when you can hold one state of consciousness as your own. Uh, o mind, return to your own abode. So I wanted to show this uh, as a follow-up or conclusion to the origin and perpetuation of disease. It puts it all in a nice order and gives you an idea of how the yogis put disease to death see, and put death in its own grave. Now all of this is coming off of this whole expose of these lessons 5, 6, and 7 where they keep talking about uh, bliss as food, mind as food, intelligence as food, prana as food, and food as food, matter as food. Uh, now, in this sloka that we were taking up, it says, The same knowledge of Brigu and Varuna is founded on the highest imperium, the supreme bliss that's hidden in the cave of the intellect. So I wanted to recall to us, this chart that we took early on in the Taitiri Upanishad classes when we first took up this great um, Upanishad for study some year and a half or so ago. Now, Inward Ascension of the Free Soul is the title of the chart, and we're taking it in conjunction with this cave of the intellect idea. They say that the mantra, for instance, is fourfold, threefold really, that is, Tripura Sundari means three parts of the mantra are hidden in your heart, in the cave of your heart. The fourth part of the mantra is what the teacher gave you. So the teacher gave you a mantra, see Om Mani Pemi Hong or Om Namah Shivaya or whatever, gave you a mantra depending on you know uh, what your ideal was, and you practiced it. and 
repetition of it and all that's going on on the first level of the mantra. But in order to get to the third, thir second, third, and fourth level of the mantra, you have to go deep in with the mantra. And uh, that's going to uh, require a journey into the cave of the intellect or the deepest part of the heart. There in the heart where all the subtle nerve endings meet, like the spokes of a chariot wheel at the hub, lies the Atman, stable but becoming manifold, as the Svetashvatar Upanishad puts it. Hundreds and thousands of nerves, like spokes of a chariot wheel, coming there and the Anahata chakra, you see. Uh, so that's going to be have to be realized as a by steps. Tripura Sundari means the, th the three most beautiful aspects of the goddess. So you're taking the mantra deeper and deeper in. You're understanding the meaning of the words, even the letters of the words, the matras. And you're just rolling these over and over in your heart in your deepest contemplations. And... Uh, when you can do that, then you've reached the second level of Tripura Sundari, and then you can reach the third and the fourth, which are more secret. You see, there each one is more secret than the last, the next. So, this cave of the intellect is very important. It occurs again and again in different uh, scriptures of India. Mentions of it in Upanishads and Gita and Ashtavaka Samhita and uh, anywhere you look, you'll find mentions of this cave of the heart, cave of the intellect, uh, and therefore. Uh, you, s you begin to realize its import. Now, one way of looking at this, and this suggests that the Taittiriya Upanishad and all the Upanishads have a friendly relationship with Kundalini Yoga. Kundalini Yoga is, you know, one of the probably the most mystical of all the yogas, and because it was that mystical, more people got interested in it first. Before they were interested in Buddhism, before they were interested in Vedanta, before they were even interested in yoga, they were interested in Kundalini. In the 60s, teachers were coming over, talking about the chakras, and talking about the lotuses, and talking about various things that you, you were having inner experiences of bliss with them, and so forth. And then afterwards, they started doing hatha, and they started, Buddhism came, and Vedanta, like an underground river, rolling the whole time underneath it all. But this idea of Kundalini Yoga is, uh, is very you know, complicated and, and uh, esoteric one. And some of the aspects of it were left out by these early teachers in the 60s. For instance, food, left out of the equation. There was no deep teaching on food. They just started to turn towards organic. Oh, let's eat sprouts, you see. Or let's make sprout ice cream or something. So it was a very surface understanding of what food really entails. And if you want to know what food really entails, and you don't know by now, then go back and reread your Taittiri Upanishad, because the whole thing is centering around food on all levels. We'll have some more teachings of that today and tomorrow. But this chart, if you remember, ha has to do with this cave of the heart. So there the Taittiri Upanishad says, there is within the heart the bright space known to all. There let the worshiper meditate upon and realize the intelligent, imperishable, self-effulgent soul. May you, O Prachina Yogya, worship in the manner described herein. And then the Taittiriya Upanishad launches in some of these teachings. So with that introductory sloka, it begins to get you interested in this imperishable, and self-effulgent, intelligent light within you, and interestingly enough, that's known by all. They say known by uh, worldly and illumined alike, and by ignorant and wise alike. It's common because it's the first thing you'll see at the time of death, and it's the first thing you'll see at the time of birth, <coughs> this light. And uh, the only thing is, is that depending on how you lived your, your life, in the light or in the darkness, or combination thereof, is how long, maybe predicate how long you can hold on to that light in lifetime. Many people cannot hold on to it, forget it, go away from it, recall it later, have a certain experience around it, see it in deep sleep, uh, have a high meditation, whatever, uh, but it, it's really an off and off again and on again experience for them, and it doesn't take over their life. You know, when God has realized this light is it, 
for the seers. They base their whole life around it, and that life is an eternal life, or at least a, a dharmic life, if not a divine life. Other kinds of life they're not interested in. Intellectual life, worldly life, earthly life, uh, those will go on fine, won't they? If you have the point, you see. If you know who you are and where you are, that you're the Atman and you've been born into the five sheaths, and you're very careful about Maya, and you're very cognizant about Brahman, then you can live a, a divine life. And the teachings are there to help you in case you forget, you see. When people come to the Dharma or to the Guru, that's a select group of people you might have seen, you see. It's only a, a great soul like Sri Ramakrishna that can, that can attract five million souls in a hundred years, you see. Or a great soul like Swami Vivekananda that can, that can convince thousands of men and women in India to give up life and dedicate it to the service of God and mankind. No one's ever done that before, ever, in the history of our of our world. You realize how hard it is to, to make one person give up their life for God. But he did it with thousands. How did he do it? He told them, you've lived many, many lifetimes. Prachina Yoga, my friend. You know, you've lived many, many lifetimes and they've all been dedicated to husband, wife, children, money, lands, possessions, ancestors. Now just give me one life dedicated to God. I just want one of those lives. You see, and so he made his he made his impression on them. You see, and they began to come, and they began to join, and they began to give up these worldly considerations, sometimes petty considerations, because a lot of karma had accrued by that. So it wasn't just that we had all of a sudden this bunch of pure souls running at Swamiji. We had a bunch of young people in knowledge of the fact that they had been given a human birth and that they wanted to use it to become perfect, to realize their inherent perfection. You know what Holy Mother said about that, right? All the people who have gathered around the Master and I are not here to have fun. They realize how fortunate they are to have been given a human birth. So we're not standing around outside of hair salons talking about how good we look today, you see. There's a few souls here gathered who are very intent upon knowing this wisdom. Christianity should know it, you see. We're Christians, basically. I mean, there's a reason why we were all born in a Christian country, whether we like Christianity or not. So we have to respect our elders. Christianity is a young kid on the block. Judaism's older. Uh, Buddhism is a young kid in the block. Veda is much older. See. And India is religion overall much older than the other religions of the world. So these are eternal truths.